The majesty of Jerusalem's Temple Mount has awed the world for thousands of years. Here Solomon built his temple. Here on the site of the Dome of the Rock, according to Muslim tradition, Muhammad ascended to the heaven. But hidden from the eye, under this sacred spot, away from the gaze of the curious, exists a dark, mysterious world of caves and tunnels that stretch for miles under the city. The secrets here are only now being revealed. Biblical historian Professor Aaron Demsky of Israel's Bar Ilan University has been exploring some of the tunnels of Jerusalem. Well, we're in one of the many tunnels that surround the Temple Mount. Many of these tunnels go back to Second Temple times, perhaps even earlier. Behind the western wall lies the Temple Mount, which is actually hollow. When Herod rebuilt the Second Temple, it was on top of a hill. He filled in the surrounding slopes, creating a large platform. Situated under the vaults and retaining walls supporting the temple platform run the tunnels, which have served a multitude of purposes over the years. In a sense, the tunnels are like a time machine. But anyone living here in Jerusalem uh, knew about these tunnels in the city, uh, underneath the city. In fact, we can speak about subterranean Jerusalem and uh, learn a lot about uh, the defense system, the water system of this ancient city. History and myth permeate these black caverns. Whispers of the Bible echo in these hollows deep under the earth. Some believe these tunnels lead to glistening diamonds and buried gold, the fabled temple treasures of King Solomon from 3,000 years ago. Jerusalem legends tell of genies and ghosts that abide here, bringing mischief and help to the denizens of the world above. And in the searing prose of the Bible, we hear of the dramatic events that took place in these shadows. Stories of desperate escapes along these forbidding corridors and feats of amazing engineering skills. Did King David really conquer the city through these tunnels? Did King Zedekiah really escape the Babylonians in this manner? Jerusalem archeologist Meir Ben Dov has also been exploring the tunnels of Jerusalem for several years. We can say that uh, we have the upper Jerusalem and the underground Jerusalem. And now we are under the city of Jerusalem, underground. Above us, above the rock, above the roof, we have the houses of the city. And we are very close to the Via Dolorosa, with the market, with the streets, the public, the people. In Jerusalem, there are two worlds, though only a few meters of rock and stone divide them. They are as distant as two cold planets circling the sun. Can the tunnels help us understand the Bible? We query whether Jericho really fell to a trumpet note. Did God really destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? The beauty of the tunnels is that they often act as a road map, authenticating history and the Bible for tourist and pilgrim alike. For those who seek proof, on the one hand, Bible relics and ancient artifacts can help substantiate religious belief. On the other hand, the discoveries help the archaeologist in distinguishing between myth and reality in regard to the past. The Bible is not a real history book, but you have there lots of history, and you have to understand it, you have to know how to read the Bible. And archaeology, it's additions, you know, the base is the Bible. Biblical archaeology is a comparatively modern pursuit. Its roots only go back to the last century, when a British team of engineers came to Jerusalem to survey and explore the Temple Mount and its surrounds. In a state of excitement, they penetrated blocked caverns, 
traversed dark tunnels and water sources and rediscovered ancient ruins hidden for centuries. These early soldier explorers, under the command of Captain Charles Warren, were the forerunners of modern day archeologists like Dr. Ronnie Reich, who's been digging in Jerusalem for over 20 years. Now Reich has come to take a second look at one of the places first explored by Warren, a natural water source just south of the temple area. In 1867, that is about 130 years ago, Charles Warren came to the spring, went into the water, and it enters into a tunnel, and then he saw a side opening into the dark. So he climbed up this vertical shaft to enter to this place where I'm here. What Warren found was a man-made underground water system carved out of the stone. It began at an entrance above and led to the shaft he had ascended. It seemed to be a concealed pathway, created so that people could draw water without being seen by an external enemy. This was vital in time of war. Undetected, Jerusalemites could still freely use their water source, the Gihon Spring. I'm standing right in the water, which is uh, coming a short distance from the spring itself, the only spring uh, in the whole surroundings of Jerusalem. This is the reason why people in ancient times, much earlier than the Israelites came here, uh, chose this hill just above our head uh, to settle here. Jerusalem was first built around 5,000 years ago in the early Bronze Age. Later, it was fortified by the Canaanites. Even in Abraham's time, Jerusalem was a noted city. In fact, in Genesis chapter 14, we read how the patriarch was blessed by Melchizedek, the king of Shalem, the ancient name for Jerusalem. But the city isn't mentioned again until many chapters, and several hundred years later, in the second book of Samuel, when King David approaches with his army to attack Jebusite Jerusalem. Then scripture tells us, and David said on that day, whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Then a few verses later we hear, so David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. But how did David conquer the city? It seems that the word gutter in Hebrew, Sinor, is the key. Biblical scholars and archaeologists have various theories as to what the word means. Well, one possibility is that Sinor is indeed the water channel. And we do know that cities were conquered by sending in crack troops through the water channel to force an entrance into the city. Does the word Sinor really indicate the Jerusalem water channel? If so, this wouldn't be the first time in antiquity that sneak attacks were made through a waterway. Warren's discovery of the shaft appeared to settle the mystery of the word Sinor. But while many biblical scholars agree that this must have been the place where David's soldiers went up the gutter and conquered the city, others still have their doubts. Reich continued to dig and found another tunnel older than Warren's shaft. It leads to a fortified water pool Reich believes that this is the original entrance into the pool, where the Canaanite inhabitants of Jerusalem drew water during times of siege, protected by an underground passage. This recent discovery opened a new debate among scholars around the origin of Jerusalem's water system. Next to me is the new fortification that we have found on the lower part of the city of David. This is a totally new discovery, and my colleagues, the archaeologists all over the world, um, were really surprised, as we of course were, and this now uh, will describe a new, totally new, the, the shape of Jerusalem, the magnitude, the ability of the people uh, 3,800 years before present. This find made headlines in the news media and stunned the academic community. In one go, it shattered the Warren Shaft theory explaining Tsinor. It also ignited a passionate debate among scholars on other issues. Some claimed that the Bible was clearly wrong, since the fortifying of Jerusalem, traditionally attributed to King David, was disproved by archaeologists finding huge towers dating back to the Canaanite Jerusalem of Abraham's time. Some say that these archaeologists should relearn the Bible. These are different components of one system. 
and this is uh, totally new. So when you gather several components together, you get something big. Others hotly dispute this, arguing that the finds actually confirm rather than contradict what the Bible tells us. All archaeological finds help us to better understand antiquity and the biblical world. So what we find here now is an archaeological illumination of what was going on in the period that's attributed to Abraham. Besides the seekers after biblical truth, the tunnels have also attracted treasure hunters. In 1910, an Englishman, Captain Montague Parker, following the Swedish mystics theory, dug here, hoping to find the ark and the treasures of Solomon's temple. After bribing the Muslim guards, he began hunting for ways to enter the Temple Mount from one of the underground tunnels. His search began close to Warren's shaft, alongside Dr. Reich's modern discovery. When Muslims found Parker digging around the mosque area by night, there was hell to pay. The cry went out, the infidels are here, Islam is being violated. As riots ensued, Parker fled the Holy Land, barely escaping with his life but his abandoned artifacts remained as witness. Montague Parker, he made here a shaft, but uh, uh, did not care to reach down to the ground, so he did not find whatever we have found here, but you can see his buckets. Do you see here the rusty buckets <laughs> over there? This is what he has left us here. Possibly the most famous old city tunnel of all, one replete with more mysteries than most of the others, is the tunnel leading off from the Gijon Spring. Here starts actually Hezekiah's tunnels, which is, by the way, still, in my opinion, one of the enigmas, uh, the constructional or engineering enigmas of the ancient world. In 701 BCE, King Hezekiah prepared the tunnel as a defense against an invading force led by the Assyrian general Sancherib, who was laying siege to the city. In the Book of Chronicles, we read how Hezekiah stopped up the single source of water in the area, the Gihon Spring. King Hezekiah's goal was twofold. Not only would he cut off the water supply to the invading army, but he could also provide an abundance of water for the residents of Jerusalem. This long and winding tunnel brought the water into the city. All the water into the city, right? This is a big difference. Everything is then there, protected. Nobody has to use any underground, hidden ways to bring a single bucket of water. In the end, Hezekiah was victorious. Jerusalem withstood the vicious siege, and a defeated Sancherib left with his Assyrian army in disgrace. But the enigma still remains, because the Bible doesn't tell us how the tunnel was built, or how it was completed so quickly. I'm now in Hezekiah's tunnel. You see very narrow. This is, it's width 60 centimeters wide, two feet. That's all. There's only always the place for one single worker with an ax to cut into the rock. The tunnel was cut so it will lead the water underground to the Pool of Siloam, which is inside the city. An inscription found at the tunnel's exit in the late 1800s provides a partial answer to some of the queries. Written in ancient Hebrew, it states, the tunneling was completed. While the hewers wielded the ax, each man toward his fellow. There was heard a man's voice calling to his fellow. The hewers hacked each toward the other, ax against ax. Two cutters in the rock started to cut, one from here, and the, his uh, uh, colleague did it from the other side. They could, of course, uh, do on their way two mistakes. One, first of all, not to meet, right? Then, as the joke goes, we would have had two tunnels for the same price. They could also make a mistake by crossing one above the other which again did not happen. They met finally. Theories vary as to how the ancients dug such a sophisticated tunnel. Some say the cutters followed a major fissure in the hard stone. But nobody yet knows the truth. 
what is probably most unique, that in a rare situation before our eyes stands a Bible story very clearly substantiated by a 2,000-year-old archaeological proof. The Hezekiah tablet is, of course, unique, for in most cases we find these tunnels, but with absolutely no ability to identify who used them, what was their purpose, or when they were built. The most well-known of these anonymous diggings are the Hasmonean tunnels located along the outside perimeter of the Temple Mount. These tunnels were also explored in the last century by Warren. To his amazement, he found cavernous passages with walls taller than any cave he had yet explored. What were they used for, and who built such high walls? One theory suggests that they were natural caverns, since it seemed unlikely that anyone would build such high walls for carrying water. The answer still escapes archaeologists. After Warren's excavation, the tunnels were resealed, and it wasn't until the mid-1980s that archaeologists re-explored them and discovered ancient artifacts from the Hasmonean and Herodian period of the Second Temple. This staggering 120-meter-long tunnel is cut out of bedrock, but is blocked by the walls of the Temple Mount, built by King Herod around 20 BCE. Its true length is unknown, and its purpose is still an enigma. As if that were not enough, another series of tunnels, some dating back nearly 3,000 years, lie to the south of the Temple Mount. This one was created by the quarries, the Jewish uh, stone cutters, who cut through the stone, reached this level, perhaps even a bit lower. And once the tunnel, the passageway, was created uh, on both sides uh, afterwards, flagstones were put above the tunnel so that one could walk above it and uh, even protect the tunnel from intruding eyes. If we accept that these tunnels date from Bible times, what might have been their purpose? We're standing at the southern wall of the Temple Mount in front of one of the most famous tunnels of underground Jerusalem, the gates of Hulda. The pilgrims coming through the gates would walk up an inclined ramp under the outside wall of the Temple Mount and lead into the temple court some 40 or 50 feet higher than this level. Ancient Jewish sources such as the Talmud tell us that there were many purification tunnels leading in and out of the temple used by priests consequent to their rituals. Other blocked entrances like the Hulda Gate, already blocked in antiquity, admitted the thousands of pilgrims who thronged the temple during the holidays. Today, the area of this ancient tunnel directly under Al-Aqsa Mosque is used for prayer by Muslim worshippers. It leads to the blocked gates on the wall. Priests, pilgrims, attacks and defense. The tunnels served all people and their purposes. But perhaps the one with the most intrigue behind it is that attributed to the last king of Judah, King Zedekiah. During his reign, destruction once more stalked Jerusalem this time in the form of the advancing, all-powerful Babylonian army. For Zedekiah, the end was near. But could there be an escape route, a way out of the trap? In the last chapter of the Book of Kings, we are told, And all the men of war fled by night, by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. And the king went that way toward the plain. Now, a curious story exists relating to the 19th century American consul in Jerusalem, a certain Mr. Barclay. When his dog disappeared, he went looking for it with his son. While pursuing the dog near the Damascus gate of the old city, Barclay scrambled through a small hole in the earth. What he then saw amazed him. A cavernous tunnel leading under the old city towards the Temple Mount, which seemingly went on for miles
Could this be the legendary cave through which Zedekiah brought out and hid the fabled temple treasures? When Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, uh, they knew that the end was there. So it said, uh, lest God forbid it fall into the hands of the Babylonians, they brought it all the way from Jerusalem through that underground tunnel or cavern and hid it at the last hole. Vendel Jones, who claims to be the real life model for Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones, believes that the legend is true. He believes this so passionately that he has spent years digging near the Dead Sea at the exact spot where he believes Zedekiah emerged. And we know that down under this mountain, there is a cavern, a cave, that's seven and a half meters high and 40, about 43 meters wide. And uh, it goes toward Jerusalem. So we believe that is the exit of what is called Zedekiah's cave in Jerusalem. An astounding claim. But is there any evidence to prove this theory? It said uh, in the end of the book of uh, Kings and Chronicles that Zedekiah the king and his army fled through the gate between the two walls. Now, it's strange to have a gate between two walls. But down in this cave, I can take you there today and show you a 3,000-year-old gate that is uh, remains from the first temple period and they fled through here and uh, this uh, is a very big cavern it's not it's not just a small tunnel it is an enormous cavern and it has a lot of tributaries going off on it the cave is immense and the story intriguing but does it bear examination while a nice story fit for a legend the cave is scarcely the length of a football field and Vendel Jones is digging more than 30 miles from Jerusalem. You can hide here, but not to escape. Even the dog of Mr. Bagley didn't escape from here. They found him. And what about Dr. Jones's theory that the temple treasures themselves were smuggled out of Jerusalem and hidden near the Dead Sea? But what is interesting is that rabbinic literature has it that King Josiah hid the Holy Ark of the Covenant the most sacred object of the people, somewhere under the Temple Mount. Could the rabbis be right? Could that most priceless of treasures, the Holy Ark, really be under Jerusalem? Could it be in one of the tunnels still to be explored, in one of the caverns still to be uncovered? And who knows, maybe in the next tunnel, or under the next rock, lies the discovery which will rock the world for the mysteries are there, waiting to be unraveled.